Hey everyone, welcome back to Bold Faith Bible. We are continuing our study in Romans here. You guys are all welcome here, of course, uh, whether you've been a Christian for a very long time or whether you don't even consider yourself a Christian. So glad to have you here uh, seeing what the Bible has to say to us today and uh, what it's all about. Um, if you have any prayer concerns or prayer requests, uh, please don't hesitate to email them directly to me at, uh, at boldfaithbible at gmail.com or you can post them in the comments in the videos below for other people to pray with you, um, and we'll uh, pray with you together on that, depending on what you'd like that to happen. If you want me to share it with a few more people, I'd be happy to share it with some of the elders at my church or uh, some other folks uh, that I know who would love to pray for you. Um, let's jump into Romans chapter 11, verse 1. This is Paul continuing his uh, letter to these people he's never met before. He's met some of them who have traveled to Rome, but he hasn't actually been there, there himself. So he's trying to cover all the bases theologically. He's trying to, um, to, to talk about all the different things about doctrine that they might need to know or where they might get into trouble. So he's, uh, in many cases, he's just kind of just hitting everything, okay? So, verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Referring to the Jews, because of course God revealed himself to the Jews, but now, now it looks like God's going to the Gentiles, right? And he says, has God rejected his people? And the answer is, may it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul is like, well, I'm a Jew, and there's lots of Jews that are becoming Christians, right? But the plan seems to have shifted from the nation of Israel revealing God to the world to this church that's made up of Gentiles and Jews, right? Verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scriptures say in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Um, remember how he, he went up to Mount Carmel and he, he um, challenged the, the prophets of Baal to this epic showdown, and he said, you call upon your false god. Um, and to call down fire from heaven, and I will call down uh, fire from heaven for my God. And so they, they went about it, hundreds of them were cutting themselves and screaming and, and never got a fire, right? And uh, Elijah then uh, prayed to the Lord and God brought fire down and all of Israel saw that, that God, uh, the Lord Almighty, is the true and living God. So they killed all the prophets of Baal, and um, it was a tremendous victory. But then the queen, whose prophets they were, was very upset and said to him that, if I catch you, I am going to kill you. And so right after this tremendous victory, he becomes extremely discouraged, and he flees for his life. And he starts asking this question like, why am I the only faithful one left? <laughs> Whereas all of Israel is just like basically turned back to God because of, uh, because of what he's just done, this, this powerful demonstration of God's presence. And uh, he, he gets super, super discouraged and he's praying to God like, why am I the only one? Verse 3, this is what he says. He says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. Now, he's speaking about the Jewish nation here, right? Verse 4, but what is the divine response to him? What, what did God say to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Verse 5, in the same way, then, there has uh, also come to be at present uh, time of remnant according to God's gracious choice. For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So we have this 
this idea, this idea in the Old Testament and throughout the Bible of this remnant that even though there are many people gathered, only a few may actually be truly sincere in their heart. And that your relationship with God is not about what nation you're a part of or what uh, temple or tabernacle you go to um, or what church, but it is about your connection directly with God. And even in the darkest of times, God will preserve a remnant, uh, people who will remain faithful to him. And so that's an encouragement back then uh, to uh, Elijah. It's an encouragement to the people in Rome, <laughs> right? Uh, but then it's also an encouragement to us, because sometimes it may feel very much like uh, you are alone, that all the, of all the people that you know, you're the only one who's really seeking God, who's really trying to be faithful to God. And God would say to you, too, that God has kept a remnant um, and he is preserving a godly people for himself. You just can't see them. All right. Um, now let's talk about here this, this, this fact that this is God who is ordaining this. This is God who is directing this. Verse 6, but if it is by grace, God's free gift, right? That's what grace means, God's free gift. It is, not, uh, is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So if God is choosing and God is giving his grace to, to people, it's not, well, as long as there's enough people that have worked hard enough for it. No, it's God looks at sinners and says, you, I want you, and you, you need to respond. Right? When Jesus walked around and started um, calling out disciples, he didn't look at righteous people and say, wow, you're really spiritual. You, I want you on my team. No, he looked at fishermen who were probably cussing up a storm and and uh, tax collectors and 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 terrorists he, he brought a terrorist on board and he wasn't looking at righteous people he was looking at what they would become because of what he was going to do in them in the same way god looked at you and looked at me and looks at other people that same way he doesn't look at what they are but what he will make them to be Perhaps you're discouraged about where you are. Maybe you're not being righteous enough. Maybe you're not as, as good of a person as you ought to be. God doesn't see you that way. God sees you through what you will become as he changes you. Praise the Lord he looks at us that way. Because we are all sinners. We are all people who do not live up to the commandments of God. The pattern that he gives us, we, we don't match up to. But he will cause us to walk in his way. That's what we see uh, back in Ezekiel, I believe it was, um, where he says that he will put his spirit upon the people in the future, right? Speaking of us, um, put his spirit in them and cause them to walk in my commandments. And so we have this, this amazing picture that, it's the Holy Spirit working within us, Christ's Holy Spirit, that is going to cause us to, to walk in the way we ought to be. And he's going to do that for people around us, people that you really don't suspect it of. People that don't seem to be living all that righteously, maybe God's going to transform them and make them to be a fellow Christian with you. Yeah. What then, verse 7, what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. Israel and the Jews worked very hard. Back then, they had their temple. They were doing sacrifices. They were doing all sorts of things. They had Pharisees and Sadducees. They had uh, priests. They had scribes. They were, they were working really hard to, to, to obtain this salvation, this, this right standing before God. It says, uh, it has not obtained, speaking of Israel, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Ouch. So the people working really, really hard to be righteous and upright and upstanding were not necessarily chosen. Because maybe they were arrogant. Arrogant. Hypocritical. They thought that they weren't as big of a sinner as that person over there. 
Jesus shares the uh, the picture of the Pharisee that stands on the street corner and says, uh, I praise you, God, that I am not a sinner like that man over there. <laughs> if there's one thing that God hates more than most things, it's someone who's arrogant and proud, someone who looks down their long nose at everyone else. And you know what? That's just like the rest of us. We don't like those people either, do we? We don't like that. Verse 8, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. So there's this idea that, that apart from from Christ, apart from God's work in us, we are we can't understand anything. We can't find our way. There is only one way to God, and that is through the person Jesus Christ. He's the one who died for us. He's the one who gives us his spirit. It's the only path that changes us. Sure, there's self-help books out there that, that tell you to, to think of yourself more positively. That uh, will will puff up your pride in order to put down this more obvious sin over there. And really what you're doing is you're just trading one sin for the next. And Satan doesn't really care and neither does God. But true change in a heart and in life is a work of God. It's the only way that we can be sustained. Because inevitably we will do what we want to do. And what do sinful people want to do? I know some people are out there and they say, well, um, children are so innocent and they, they, uh, until they're corrupted by society. If you've ever been around kids, you know that that is absolutely not true. They don't learn to lie and, and steal from their parents, usually. Um, they usually figure that out on their own. It comes from within their little corrupt hearts. That's what the Bible speaks about, that we are born in sin, that we have a sin nature. Until we are delivered, until we are rescued from that sin nature, we will just keep doing evil stuff. Sometimes we do what appears to be good stuff, but we do it for evil intentions, whether it's to boast about it or so that I can feel better about myself than about you, right? You wicked people over there. I am so righteous and and uh, I am much better than you. That's that's evil. I don't care if I am uh, going out there and uh, working at orphanages and 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 reading the Bible 24 hours a day. If I treat other people like that and I'm doing it all just so I can be known as a super spiritual person, obviously that's evil. Because I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. And there's much of that that goes on. A lot of people like a pat on the back or are working to earn a living at teaching the Bible or, or being a Christian. And you must be wary of these people. Verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? So he's basically asking the question, so it was was it their fault? Was it their fault that they that they messed up? But by their transgression salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So the Jews rejected Jesus, their king. So Jesus left. And when he left, it opened up the door wide for all the Gentiles to take over the church basically. The, the Jews are supposed to be leading the church, but nowadays it's mostly the Gentiles who run the church worldwide. So was it their fault, the Jews, that they just didn't work hard enough? They, didn't, they made a mistake somewhere? Verse 12, now if their transgression, you know, their sin, their rejection of, of the Lord, uh, is riches for the world... And their failure is riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their fulfillment be? How much 
how much greater will things be when the Jews finally accept Jesus as their Savior and as their King? Verse 13, But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, Inasmuch as then, as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. So, sometimes there's this, this accusation level to Paul that he's, that though he's a Jew, he's kind of like sold out the Jews and he's just gone native with the Gentiles, right? Um, for those of you who are wondering, um, Gentile just means non-Jew, okay? You're a Jew or, uh, or Jewish or you are Gentile. That's just, that's how Jews address the world. And they're the ones who wrote the Bible. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I am a Gentile. So, uh, and many of you probably are as well. So, um, people accuse Paul of selling out and going native to the Gentiles and he's not really a real Jew anymore and he doesn't really care about the Jews. All he wants to do is just make a name for himself amongst the Gentiles. Um, but he says that, that, that the purpose of his ministry is to make the Jews jealous, that they see all the mighty signs and wonders that are happening through the through the Gentile church and seeing how close a relationship they have with God that the Jews you know, don't have, that they will say, I want that. I want that. It's not to say that some of the Jews didn't get saved. But many of them did. And many of them still do. But the majority of them have still chosen to reject Jesus as their Messiah. And so... Part of the reason for the whole worldwide church of Gentiles is to get the Jews to finally say, fine, we'll take Jesus as our Messiah. But we want that close relationship that those Gentiles seem to have with God. Verse 15, for if their rejection is, is the reconciliation of the world, so all the Jews you know, are getting right with God because the Jews rejected Jesus, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So basically, the promises that Jesus came and brought, this kingdom of God upon earth, were promises that were contingent upon the Jews accepting him as their Messiah, which they did not. And so we still look forward to this day where Jesus comes back and Acts fulfills those promises that he's made. And that will happen when the Jewish nation as a whole, accepts Jesus as their Messiah. We look forward to that day. That will be a glorious day. And all of us Gentiles will, as believers, will gladly step aside and let the Jews take the leadership positions that they've been called to. God is a God of order, and he has put uh, hierarchies, rankings, not not that one person is worth more than another person. A Jew is not, a Jewish person is not worth more than I am. They're not. But if, if there's a Jewish believer, um, I'm going to defer to them because they have a special place. They have a special place. Now, if they say something that's unbiblical, I'll call them out on just like anybody else, right? Because I serve my Lord, Jesus. Uh, and not uh, a person, but I respect those whom God has put in positions of authority and those uh, and the, the order that God has put on the earth. Um, verse 16, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them of the root of the olive tree. So speaking of like this picture, okay, so like you have the, the Jewish nation is like an olive tree, okay, and God got upset with some of the branches because they didn't believe in God. They didn't actually seek God, so he broke the branches off. And then, if you and I Gentiles, we believed in Jesus, and we, and so we've been grafted into this, this holy uh, plant, this, uh, this 
Uh, we have our father Abraham. We're not blood descendants. We're kind of adoptees, so to speak. It says, "Do not." Verse eighteen: Do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. That goes for uh, for Jews as well as Gentiles. Okay, um, the root is Christ. Okay, Christ brings the nourishment and and brings the Holy Spirit into our lives. We do not support Jesus. We are supported by Jesus, and He is the one who calls the shots because it's all about Him. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in, right? That the Jewish non-believers were taken out of the nation of, uh, of faith, and we are grafted in as, as Gentile believers. Um, verse 20, quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited or puffed up or proud, but fear for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. If we do not walk as we ought to, if we do not have genuine um, faith in the Lord, then we are. it's not to say that we will lose our salvation, but rather that, that we were never saved in the first place. Your children do not have a guaranteed seat on the bus or uh, space on the, the tree, so to speak, unless they too personally... Um, have have faith in the Lord, right? It is all about where each of us stand individually before the Lord. And this is not to not once again not to suggest that you know you you can uh, every time you mess up you lose your salvation and you got to earn it back because that that negates the whole grace thing he was just talking about in verse six. What he's talking about here is that nobody should assume that they have a seat on the bus because they're special. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter who your grandparents are. It doesn't matter if your parents started this church or your uncle is a pastor or your, your niece or nephew is a missionary in Zambia or whatever. You need to have a personal relationship with the Lord. A genuine personal relationship with the Lord. If you don't, None of those things will do a thing for you. Other people's faith cannot save you. Have you been changed by the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit at work within your life proving that you are saved? Because if not, you're not on the tree, okay? You're not grafted in. If God did not spare the, the people who started on the tree but did not believe... He will not spare you who don't even belong on the tree. Verse 22. Behold then the kindness on one hand and the severity of God to those who fell, those who choose not to believe, severity. But to you who believe, right, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. 23, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, so if those who reject God don't continue in their rejecting of God, um, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So if the Jews who have rejected God suddenly say, you know, actually we're wrong, uh, we, we will accept Jesus as our Messiah, um, God just puts them back in. If he puts non-branches back on, he can put off the broken branches back on uh, just as easy, if not easier, right? Verse 24, for if you were cut off from what is uh, by nature a wild olive tree, speaking of us Gentiles, we're from a wild tree, not this one, um, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Of course, the, the natural branches will be brought back in even faster, right? Um, speaking once again of the Jews, God wants the Jews to come back to him. All of them. All over the world. Verse 25, For I do not want you, to, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, 
so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So just as God hardened the heart of uh, Pharaoh, right, um, so that he could display his power and his wonders uh, to the people of Israel and to Egypt, so this hardening is happening to the people of Israel so that uh, many, many, many Gentiles from across the entire world will be saved. Verse 26, And so all Israel will, will be saved, just as it is written, The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When Jesus comes back, Israel will accept him and will be faithful. As we're going to see over in the book of Revelation, we have this time period, the tribulation, where um, it appears the nation of Israel will take its, its place as leaders in the church, the global church, and they will accomplish the, the great missionary task that has been set before us. 144,000 witnesses will go out preaching the gospel from, from Israel and go to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus will come back and, and the kingdom will be established. Verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the, the fathers. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because of them, God loves the people of Israel and he will watch out for them. So you better be careful. If you, if you get into this mind, well, we've accepted Jesus and they've rejected him, so um, we're better than them. Well, Israel still has a place in God's heart. And so you should be careful. You should always respect that. They have a role that, that us Gentiles do not have. Does that mean God loves us less? No, it doesn't. It just means that there's some special promises that are made to them that haven't been made to us. And uh, some of them particularly uh, refer to those who bless the Jews will be blessed and those who curse them will be cursed. So, if you believe God, watch yourself. Verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Not because they're so great or they're so obedient or they're so faithful, but because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. This gets to where I was saying this isn't about you get saved and then you do something wrong and you're not saved anymore. And then you get saved again and then you... When you're called by God and you are given the Holy Spirit, verse 29 applies here. Just as the Jews, the promises made to the Jews don't get canceled out because they make a mistake. The calling of God on a Christian's life doesn't get canceled out just because you make a mistake. There's grace and mercy for, for you. Um, there may be discipline, there may be consequences, but it doesn't mean you stop being a child of God. Verse 30, For just as you were once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that, that, uh, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown, now be shown mercy. This just, God's desire is to show mercy to people. For all who call upon his name will be saved. So it, it gets, a, it's as simple as that. Anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's as simple as that. But it's a little more complex because there are Gentiles, there's Jews, and there's all these conversations about this and that, who's chosen. Those who believe in Jesus are chosen for salvation. Those who are born in the right family were chosen for a special blessing and, and a certain parcel of land on this planet that uh, us Gentiles are not a part of that promise, okay? Verse 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. We've all been born with a sin nature 
on this planet, and he has allowed that to happen so that he may show us mercy. Uh, Why didn't he just um, strike down Adam and Eve and start anew? Because much of what the purpose of this planet is all about in us is that God shows mercy to those who are sinful and rebellious, showing his patience, his love, his compassion. He saves the very worst of us in order to be a demonstration to all the angels and all of history how much and how great his love is. Which is what he says and gets into here at the end of the chapter. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. So he's like breaking out into song here, right? Because how amazing is it that this is all about God showing mercy to us? Verse 34 He's quoting from the Old Testament here. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first, has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. It's all about God showing mercy to everyone and compassion And because of that, he has put up with the incredible wickedness, the evilness that is happening uh, across the whole world. Now, I don't want you to understand that that this chapter is invalidating what the previous chapters have talked about, which is very clear that those who reject Jesus, those who do not place their faith in Jesus, have a very real place called hell that they are destined for. He is to show mercy, but every day we wake up without having been judged is another day of mercy. Another chance for us to place our faith in Christ. And once you've done that, then he showers his mercy and his grace upon you all the more, seals you with his Holy Spirit so that you will forever be his. You are his child now, and he will um, not abandon his child. We do that. He doesn't do that. He loves all people and has given everyone chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. He has given you another chance right now. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I, I, I plead with you. Give your life to Christ. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, let that sink in how much he has loved you and how much mercy he has shown you. Well, God bless. Hope you have a great week. I'll see you again here 6 a.m. on Sunday for the Revelation study or whenever you get around to watching the video. Um, I'm asleep then at 6 (laughs) a.m. on Sunday. And uh, a few uh, hour later, I get up to go to, to church and I don't even pop out until afterwards. So if you guys are going to church on Sunday morning, good for you. Catch the video Sunday night or or Monday or whenever, and that is awesome. Have a great week, like I said, and God bless you all.